In this video, we are going to talk about the future of sustainable land use. So before starting this video, please like this video, and subscribe to our channel and comment below that you subscribed then I will reply back as soon as I see it. Land use sustainability is a critical component of long-term global growth. Many environmental goals, such as the conservation of water, soil, biodiversity, and ecosystem services, as well as social goals like food production, securing livelihoods, and access to natural resources, are commonly seen as preconditions for sustainable land use and management. Land is, however, under threat. Cropland and pastureland develop at the expense of forests and natural areas around the world. Urbanization and built-up areas encroach on agricultural land, and land erosion, soil depletion, and terrestrial biodiversity continue unabated, UNIP 2014. In light of this, both domestically and internationally, political action is urgently required to foster sustainable land use governance. The latter will be the object of our attention. Despite being categorized as a local, i.e., non-transboundary, problem, land use deserves to be resolved by international policies because it has international implications, Jinsky 2015. Agriculture, forestry, and other land uses, for example, account for about a quarter of all anthropogenic GHG emissions. 3. As a result, land use is connected to the destabilization of the atmosphere, a global common good, and land use-related emissions are also on the rise for IPCC 2014. Second, human impacts and land loss endanger biodiversity hotspots with endangered, globally unique, species as well as wildlife species migrating through countries, e.g., birds and mammals, Mayer 2012, Myers et al., 2000. Joint, that is, multinational, efforts are needed to prevent their extinction. Furthermore, excessive land use in one country can result in water scarcity or pollution in nearby countries. Another crucial international challenge is the promotion of food protection, which is inextricably related to land management. Finally, international rulemaking will improve domestic land use regimes and promote learning processes, both nationally and globally, with positive effects on sustainable development. As a result, the GLOBALANDS project, in which this paper was written, was devoted to examining international pathways for strengthening sustainable land use. Here's a list of the future of sustainable land use, let's start. Number 4. Prospects for the future. The Earth's habitats are in grave danger due to luck transition. According to one calculation, the secure upper limit for global cropland area is 15% of total terrestrial area, which is just around 3 percentage points higher than current cropland area of 12% of global land area. However, according to another UNFCCC Commission calculation, current global agricultural production has already crossed the safe boundary. The present rate of extinction is 100 minus 1000 times higher than the pre-industrial age average, indicating that biodiversity loss has already exceeded the upper limit. Furthermore, freshwater supplies are being depleted as a result of that population and climate change, which has increased variability and decreased availability in dry areas. The growing demand for bioenergy has put additional strain on land and water supplies. Half of global cereal consumption was due to U.S. ethanol output in 2005-06 to 2007-08, and FAO, OECD estimates indicate that bioenergy will account for 52% of maize and 32% of oilseed demand by 2020. According to estimates, clearing forests and grassland would account for a significant portion of the bioenergy production sector. These developments indicate that business as usual is not a viable option. So, what can be done to ensure food security, biodiversity protection, and energy security in the long run? A recent forecasting study revealed that global yield growth is slowing. Food security is possible, but it will necessitate rising food production by increased agricultural productivity in low-income countries, where the yield gap is the greatest. This will necessitate overcoming the constraints that restrict higher yield in such areas. Number 3. Land use and land use modeled in scenario exercises. Theory is used to connect changes with biophysical and socioeconomic drivers in models for predicting potential luck transition. The historical relationship between luck and its drivers is then established using statistical methods. Geographic, economic, and ecological models are the three primary types of models that have emerged from various disciplines. 
Land allocation is based on the suitability of land use and the geographical position of habitats and population in geographic models. As a result, spatial models aim to best assign land use to areas with the least amount of ecological impact. Models capture the potential productivity of various land uses better than economic models and are better able to represent land management. Prices and other foreign input variables, on the other hand, are assumed to be exogenous in regional models. As a result, they are less able to represent the impact of global trade on market-driven agent action. Demand and supply of land-based goods and services are the focus of economic models. They more accurately represent the impact of globalization and international trade on luck change. Economic models also employ scenarios to account for the impact of policies and other socioeconomic variables on luck. Land allocation is linked to species abundance and extinction, biological footprints, and other environmental issues in ecological models. Prices and other economic variables are often assumed to be exogenous factors in ecological modeling, resulting in a failure to properly account for their impacts and related trade-offs in land allocation. Luck modeling has become more integrated over time, bridging the disciplinary gap. In reality, integrated models outperform specialized models in terms of predictive accuracy. The ecological interrelationships of various land uses, as well as the integrated approach that characterizes sustainable growth, fit well with such an integrated approach. Integrated models, for example, are needed to achieve the goals of food security, biodiversity, and bioenergy while optimizing human welfare. Despite this development, predicting future luck remains a difficult task. Unpredictable shocks and events, as well as the integration of human actions into luck models, have remained elusive, resulting in weak forecasting. Number 2. The effectiveness of land management systems at the sectoral level. The role of market-based instruments MBIs, in reducing land use conversions and other environmental issues is gaining traction. For resolving environmental problems, MBIs have the ability to be a more effective alternative to regulatory legislation and prescriptive rules. Over the last two decades, forest certification and eco-labeling have become the most promising MBIs for improving sustainable forest harvesting and management. Forest goods sold in high-income countries with stringent environmental requirements must be accompanied by a forest certificate certifying that they were not harvested from protected areas or other ecologically sensitive areas. Forest certification, on the other hand, is generally limited to a few businesses exporting their goods to environmentally conscious markets. Conservation easement schemes, which include bilateral agreements with landowners or users to refrain from developing or using land for a specific purpose, have had a lot of success in high-income countries. Other MBIs have been used, but in high-income countries they have been more effective than in low-income countries. Programs aimed at improving payments for ecosystem services have also proven to be reasonably effective in medium and low-income countries PES. The PES systems compensate landowners and consumers for taking environmentally friendly actions or refraining from harmful activities. Over the last two decades, there has been a rapid rise in interest in PES. There are currently over 300 projects in place around the world, with the majority of them addressing biodiversity, watershed resources, carbon sequestration, and landscape beauty. Water-related PES seem to be more successful than others, owing to the fact that the customers are the direct beneficiaries of the service, as opposed to biodiversity and carbon PES, where the beneficiaries are the global population and the buyers are those acting as intermediaries for the current and potential world community. Number 1. Land use change happen in practice, and how are competing demands on land managed? The case studies of Brazil, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Indonesia are used to demonstrate the effect of country policies on luck transition. Brazil, which contains the majority of the Amazon, has adopted policies that have resulted in the Amazon's destruction and then recovery. Until 2011, policies encouraging Amazon colonization cleared roughly 19 percent, 762,000 square kilometers, of the original Amazon forest region. Between 1980 and 2011, about 72% of the forest was cleared. Brazil's federal, provincial, and local governments, on the other hand, recognized the detrimental consequences of the deforestation and took steps to halt it. Brazil was able to minimize deforestation by 74% in just five years with the support of foreign donors, 2004 to 2009. 
Indonesia, too, offered timber concessions, which resulted in rapid deforestation. Deforestation was also aided by agricultural expansion, especially palm oil production and forest management decentralization. Local governments used timber concessions to raise revenue due to decentralization of forest management and restricted local government budgets. The Indonesian government, like Brazil's, has embarked on efforts to curb deforestation in partnership with foreign donors. These efforts included stringent regulation of protected areas as well as financial incentives for forest protection. Programs for community forest management were also introduced. According to recent statistics, Indonesia's annual deforestation rate decreased from 1.7% in 1990 to 2000 to just 0.5% in 2010. The Democratic Republic of Congo DRC, has a very different pattern in terms of forest patterns. Deforestation has been slowed in the DRC due to a lack of infrastructure and instability, which discourages commercial logging. However, chainsaw loggers and small-scale businesses engage in extensive illegal logging for domestic markets and illegal export to neighboring countries. What do you think of our video? Let me know in the comment section below. If you enjoy this video and want to hear from me again, be sure to hit that subscribe button before you go. Thanks for watching.